Good evening to everybody who is joining the fourth already webinar in the series or webinars. Um, the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation and me as a um, rapporteur for a new report of the International Trade Committee in the European Parliament on the trade and investment relations are uh, organizing together. Um, this series of webinars is organized and um, started under a common slogan. We are in a listening mood. We want to get knowledge, to get information, to get initiatives and thoughts you want to introduce to us concerning the future shaping of the trade and investment relations between the EU and the African Union, the different member states of the African Union, uh, and of course also to deal with such complex questions we are uh, anytime are uh, meeting again and again. There is a contradiction between the need for development, the need for dealing with a real concern, daily concerns of common people at the African continent. Uh, there is, of course, also the experience of the economic partnership agreements between the African Union uh, its member states and some of the regions, in particular the East African communities, the Southern um, Development Corporation, the, the ECOWAS, etc. So I don't go now in the detail because I want to introduce already the first uh, speaker uh, in our today's uh, evening event. And I have to uh, make clear also and uh, small excuse that I have to leave in, in, in some minutes because I have to speak in the plenary. We are discussing there the rule of law situation within the European Union. When we are being an, um, a benchmark, as we are thinking for other countries, we have, of course, also to take control of our own uh, reality and our uh, political uh, situation here. So I have to excuse that is by occasion which was not planned in, uh, in the beginning of this webinar. But I want to give the floor just now to Hamida Dedat from the COSATO in South Africa to introduce aspects yeah, of the reality in your country. Uh, what do you see as a necessary uh, issue uh, which has to be taken on board while we are drafting the report, while we are speaking about uh, the future relationship between the EU and Africa, and not to forget, Tomorrow starts in Paris, the EU Africa Summit. A lot of expectations, a lot of rumors, and maybe our today's evening webinar is enlightening us also to, to see what is the outcome of such a um, summit, which is planned to be, um, the, to, to be uh, the, the, the start for establishing a new real partnership on equal footing between the European Union and African Union. So, Hamida, the floor is yours. Good evening, everybody, and thank you very much, um, Helmut, as well as um, the organizers and Rosa Luxemburg for this, what is really quite an esteemed opportunity. Um, as I was introduced, I'm the executive director of Naledi, which is the research arm for Kosatra. So, um, I will contextualize some of the discussions or some of my inputs in the context of um, labor but more specifically as an African. So I must say when I was pre preparing this and I was, and I was told, look, you've got about five or seven minutes to present, um, you know, to present to everybody um, as an opening remark. There's so many key issues that one would want to choose. I mean, I think Helmut made reference to the EPA. So there's a particular relationship um, in, in, in terms of how the EPAs came about going back as far as the GATS and the four Singapore issues and how many of us um, my son is 14, so he's the benchmark of how many of us actually contested and did not support or agree up to now with the, with the, with the EPAs, uh, both at the SADC level as well as within, within the continent, and yet uh, the EPAs have gone ahead. Um, when one looks at the issues of COVID, and I think any of us from an, from an African continent perspective and from a developing world perspective, I think the inequalities that are absolutely stark between the North and South, and if you talk about specifically within the EU and Africa, it needs no introduction. I think when you look at the issues of migrants, you look at people that are moving between the different continents, you look at the number of Africans that are actually, you know, boarding planes in tires or uh, sailing on, on, on water boats or rafts. Um, if you take the issues around the Somalian pirates, 
I mean, if you look at what's happening in, in, in Nigeria, so there's so many aspects in relation to the impoverishment of our continent. Um, now, that's not to say that every single thing lies at the feet of the EU or at the, at, at the US, but I think the kinds of arrangements, particularly when we come from the traditions of the WTO, when we talk about trade liberalization being a mechanism to perpetuate rather uh, perpetuate the inequalities rather than actually, as, as Helmut, in, Helmut indicated, um, actually equaling the, the playing field, then it becomes problematic. So maybe to become a lot more concrete and just to say it's one specific example, and I think it, it, um, I'd like to use that to set the tone um, of how we can take the, the, the issues forward as opposed to um, the several other issues that, are, that I'd like to speak to, one being specifically energy, which is uh, something I'm really passionate about. But I recently, uh, you know, when I was preparing for this uh, presentation, I, I saw that the EU has made a commitment to over 150 billion euros, I made reference to it's the African gateway or the gateway to Africa in, in terms of its investment. Now, when I look up, what does this, um, what does it actually mean? Um, what are the key features? It's talking about green, uh, a, a green transition for Africa. It's talking about the just transition. It's talking about sustainable development and decent jobs, which of course is in relation to the SDGs. It's talking about health and it's talking about education and training. Now, if you see that, the, if you take the, the gateway as one specific um, or one major investment, and if you look at the key priorities identified, with all due respect, the only country in the continent that currently understands or is even advancing a so-called green economy or green transition is South Africa. And that's because we're largely responsible for coal. Um, Sassel is, sing is the single point when you, when you go and you look for uh, greenhouse gas emissions. If you zone in, into South Africa, you'd pick up Secunda with Sassel being um, the, the oil refinery. Of course, we have a contribution to greenhouse gas emissions by virtue of the fact that coal or fossil fuel um, is quite um, strategic in our, in, in, our, um, um, in our economy and has been so historically. We suffer the, 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 the legacy of apartheid, the communities in Mpumalanga in particular. But overall, the GDP, oh, sorry, the overall contribution that South Africans or that South Africa contributes to the greenhouse gas emissions is less than 1%. So if we, the largest economy, or one of the largest economies that we largely fossil fuel based, why is the agenda a green agenda? Why is the agenda a just transition? Why is the agenda green jobs and green hydrogen? So that's not our agenda, right? And, and when you then link that to the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement and you link it to the EPAs and you look at the key sectors as well as what it is that you're wanting to achieve, it's not speaking to the true issues that we as Africans are confronting. If you take energy as an example, and I indicated this is my fetish, if you take the energy uh, case in point, the, the kinds of examples that we in, as Africans can learn from, from you as uh, in the EU is that privatization of a, of a public good is, is, leads to no good. Um, we can go in the, in the question and answer session I hope I get the opportunity to expand a bit more, but in October, 2021, the devastation in relation to the escalating prices of electricity under private sector uh, control um, demonstrated quite specifically why, or quite, uh, quite um, blatantly why you should actually keep your public utility, um, in South Africa's case, ESCOM, public. So we are now sitting with investors from Europe um, from the EU countries who actually wanting to bid for ESCOM, which is our public utility, and wanting to support the unbundling and the privatization, yet the EU countries, and there's a range of countries um, from the UK um, all the way up, I mean, it's obviously Brexit, but I mean, during the time that they, it was still part of the EU, as well as the other EU countries from France to Norway, all suffering really harsh consequences of privatization of electricity. So these are positive lessons for us as Africans. But instead, what the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement is doing as well as what the EPAs are doing is facilitating a process for neoliberalism and a different kind of, of economic colonialism that we don't, we don't appreciate. From a workers' perspective, of course, when you go privatization, it means retrenchments, it means casualization, it means precarity, and it definitely means that we move further away from our SDG of decent work um, and sustainable jobs. Um, when we look at the question of the 4IR, that's then per perpetuated. So if 
we, if, if I'm, I'm not sure in terms of time, but I mean, I wanted to give a, a, a positive spin and I'm hoping that um, in terms of the discussions going forward and in preparation for how can we change the relations, relations between Africa and the EU, I mean, in the context of the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, which many of us, again, who, who contested the EPAs, those of us who understand the difficulties around an Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement being forced, and I, I, that's my biased opinion, it's been forced upon us um, when we're not ready for it. If you take the EU and you take the fact that you are customs union, if you look at the extent to which you've come together as a region, right, all these, all these 27 countries with a common identity, a common understanding of free, of, of free movement, free trade, um, issues of rules of origin, um, your relationship as a power block against the rest of the world, that's solidified. So if you wanted to know when, how could you actually support us as Africans, is how about you teach us to become an AU in the same way that is parallel with the EU. And I think Helmut, that would then put us on the same playing field because the current, whether you talk China, whether you talk the US, whether you talk WTO, whether you talk bilaterals, whether you talk EPAs, whether you talk GATS, the playing field has never been equal. And the current perpetuation of any trade agreement, including the ACFTA, has taken us further away from the 2002 Sustainable Development Goals, as well as the SDGs. Agenda 2063, in, in, in maybe 2010 seemed possible or 2015 seemed possible, it's a myth. It's not gonna happen because the key, and in fact, our, the, the words that I wanted to end with is to say, well, I'm happy to be proven wrong. I'm really, I will be, I will be ecstatic if you can prove me wrong. If we do a matrix and we do a monitoring and evaluation uh, process where you actually look at every single investment, every single trade agreement, um, every single investment agreement that has been ha that has happened between the EU and, and Africa as a continent, not just Southern Africa. And if you look at what the key objectives are, both in relation to for us as, as, as Africans, but also for you as the EU, you will find those same um, indicators in the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. And it, it speaks to underdevelopment and impoverishment. It does not speak to the development of African countries and it does not speak to um, equaling the playing field. The rich are going to get richer, the poor are going to get poorer. And, the, the, and in, where, where workers are concerned, it's precarity. I mean, 40% of our, in, our economies are informal in the continent. And South Africa that largely had a formal base, had a manufacturing sector, we are deindustrializing. We are losing our manufacturing capacity, and we're supporting green hydrogen when the sun is free. So I think we really um, we, we, we need we need to change the paradigm. And I think the fact that the some of the um, the resonance, particularly in the energy space across the EU, um, with the with the UK Labour Party, for example, demanding nationalisation of electricity, um, and starting and I think it was Spain where, where, where there was a call for changing the paradigm. Um, I think the, the, the issues in relation to climate, the COVID challenges, um, the issues of poverty and starvation, particularly on our continent, um, really creates an opportunity. And I think the fact that we have an AU-EU summit, um, if we can really start change, really being, be committed um, to wanting to, to level the playing field, I think there's several um, spaces and sectors, and I'm very uh, happy to, to engage at a more uh, sector-specific level on how we, we can take that forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hameda. Um, just a quick, quick information, uh, Helmut has a speech in the European Parliament, so he will join us a few minutes later. Um, thank you for your views and for your insights. And I would um, take care of the moderation now, and I would like to hand over to Suet Aden Osman. Um, I'm very grateful that you are with us today and just uh, some quick information about you. You are the executive director of the Coalition for Dialogue in Africa. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Arif. Um, I really appreciated the energy of my sister. Uh, it is true that um, the Coalition for Dialogue in Africa is a platform for dialogue and debate that was established as a special initiative of the African Union, African Development Bank, UN Economic Commission about a decade and a half ago. 
And it was um, meant to bring the views of the academia, media, civil society into the intergovernmental processes of the AU, because as you know, intergovernmental organizations, a platform of politicians and diplomats, um, inclusivity is a very complex matter. So we keep trying to bring those views to them. Um, but um, I was asked by, uh, he wanted to speak to a little bit on the SDGs, achievement of SDGs versus the African uh, continental free trade. I, I wouldn't agree more with my sister on, on how far we seem to be from achieving any meaningful um, impact on the lives and livelihoods of people whether it is this one, um, this, we call it in the jargons of the AU, a flagship project of the Agenda 2063 or any other one, but um, it's worth trying. Uh, it's true that the, the fundamentals are not even there. I mean, moving in the continent is still even an issue. Uh, I don't even see how they believe that products will move on their own when they are not accepting people movements. Um, but uh, beyond that, the achievement of the of the goals and aspirations to improve the, the, the lives of people, uh, regardless of which agenda we're talking about, because somehow the aspirations in one and the goals in the other seem to be aligned. Um, in a continent that continues to deal with an excessive extractivism, uh, and uh, what goes where we continue to be the source and uh, we know the destinations, is not going to see any meaningful change happening unless the attitude and the partnerships are revised properly. I, I like the fact that uh, this particular summit is, has been posed as one that is going to be somehow a game changer. We are told that uh, it is the, the, the summit where uh, that will present an opportunity, a summit of the AU and EU that will present a new opportunity for a new alliance, a new renewed partnership. Uh, but uh, the, the definition of that partnership and what, how, what we do with it, I, I'm glad it's Southerners that are talking this evening, uh, this whole debate about, we, because we are very much into this pandemic still, uh, the biotechnology company in Cape Town that announced uh, this month that it had succeeded in reproducing, uh, producing its uh, M mRNA vaccine and they're a program backed by the, F by the WHO. But the experts are worried that the project will be blocked by Moderna patents. Now, the, the question is always the same. Uh, the, the fact that we do not accept that ownership that ownership, uh, long-term ownership and capacity is what Africans will need for us to do anything. But even when we get to a nation, I mean, something sparkles anywhere. The feeling that we have is that it's quickly smashed. And the expectation is that uh, Africans, whether it's the private sector, will continue to be spectators of a proxy war between the West and the East now. Uh, so the vaccines, the Indian or Chinese and Russian vaccines should not come uh, uh, because we, I mean, that attitude that doesn't even recognize that there are scientists and researchers uh, on this continent and manufacturers and that they need to be allowed to get into the game uh, because we can afford to squeeze governments, um, cannot yield any, any meaningful change that. So unless and until we recognize uh, that uh, any conversation that will evolve around the trade is going to be one that needs to first and foremost recognize that first hand insight will be given by Africans to the East to, to, to provide the solutions and that, and that they have to move into trial and error attitude. We don't have to buy ready-made uh, ideas, products, anything. We cannot continue to import. I mean, capacity has to be imported. Um, 
activists today, well, they are now they, they launched it yesterday in South Africa again, um, saying that this deal that is going to be cut was it today or tomorrow uh, among uh, with with the government of 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 Rwanda and 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 Senegal, where Germany is going to send containers where that are labs and they will produce end to end vaccines. I mean that kind of things that doesn't even recognize that the acceptance acceptance of this vaccine will depend on whether or not the process that brings it about will be accepted itself is, is still mind-bugging in 2022. Um, I think that I will, we, will, we will be able to listen to the remaining bit uh, of, of the debate, but um, one of the major problems in trade we have is that uh, we keep seeing um, resources. We, we, we will say the Africans are endowed, but then natural resources that are not providing, for which we're not getting real value, keep leaving the continent. Illicit financial flows, it's, it's really flows. It's, it goes, it has sourced as destination. We know where it goes from and where it goes to. And the, the, we, it has even been quantified. Uh, it continues to be assessed and, and the figures are staggering. We're talking right now, the, the most conservative figure that the United Nations, ACTAD and others are coming up with are talking about 100 billion yearly. So the, a continent that is a net exporter of capitals, a continent that exports natural resources without getting value for it. And even when there is a little bit that is supposed to come, it's as if a, a huge machine comes behind it and tries somehow to smash it. The, the inclusive framework of the OECD is one that we are really worried about. We, we keep being worried about things we are watching uh, and uh, happening. And you keep telling them to the OECD secretariat, but please, you can't turn yourself into a United Nations OECD is OECD. We know what it was set up with for. We know it is a club of rich boys. They cannot impose a, a game changer. They are changing the international taxing rules without, the, 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 without a proper say from the South. The only two countries. So uh, South Africa is an exception because they are also part of the G20, but the rest of the continent didn't have real say in it. The only two countries that could technically follow up, follow the conversation and, and withdraw from the, from the deal, Nigeria, because they are big enough, and Kenya, because they were bold enough in this particular context. And even that, you just, so we, we, we wonder, I mean, it's, you're coming to do business, you don't want to pay taxes to the poor, you continue to try and so that, 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 that whole thing that is going to, this morning we were on another webinar and the main concern was that everything that is happening is actually happening in West Africa in the context of insecurity um, based on what we have seen happening in Mali and Burkina Faso and, and Guinea and others and you say but that is what is going to continue to happen. In the case of Mali, it is nothing else but the youth, whether it is civilian, military, the youth saying, no, it's enough, no more extractivism, no more just taking what belongs to others because it's not possible. So the, the question is always the same. If the feeling uh, when you go to these discussions is always the, the, the one that as Hamida was saying, the playing field has never been level. Well, then I don't know who is discussing with who and, and how are we going to get out of this kind of things. So we will see and we will follow, but I want to stop here. We will be able to ask questions. Thank you very much, Ali. Thank you very much, Suat. Um, I can see that Talmud is uh, still busy in the European Parliament, uh, so let me just welcome Francis Davis and also a uh, member of the European Parliament, Joachim Schuster. Uh, you are very much welcome in this webinar. And um, we will 
we will continue with Francis Davis. Uh, Francis Davis is from Zambia Alliance of Agroecology and Biodiversity. And uh, she will speak about the trade relationship between the EU and Southern African countries with a focus on agriculture and recommendations for change. Please, the floor is yours. Greetings, thank you very much. Um, it's wonderful to be here and um, thank you for the invitation. Um, so, so just to, to say, my name is Frances Davies and I work with the Zamin Alliance for Agroecology and Biodiversity, but I, um, I also work with a number of the other food sovereignty networks and people's movements in Africa, um, the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa and Seed and Knowledge Initiative um, in the South. And so um, uh, it's, it's an honor to be here, but I do, I come with a lot of other other voices, and so it's it's important to remember them, and also to say that our movement um, really is working on on food sovereignty issues, and particularly around the seed um, and biotechnology laws um, in our countries, in in our in our sovereign nations, but as well as um, you know on the continent. But but we haven't worked; we're definitely not trade experts, and so. Um, I would just like to, you know, it's it's a privilege to be here with my the other colleagues from from the continent, and thank you for what has already been raised. Um, so I did have a presentation that I prepared, but uh, otherwise I could just speak to this um, if that's easier, rather than given the amount of time that that we have. Um, should I should I share my screen or? Can I just? Um, Please, you can share your screen. Okay, I think that you. should be possible. Okay. Um, just give me a moment. Um, sorry. Oh dear, I'm having, let me get out this view. Thank you. Um, so just firstly, I think what's really important is to situate this um, conversation in, in the context of the crisis that is hitting our countries um, and we've had the multiple shocks that we keep on facing and Africa, Southern African countries are the, the foundation is our food and agricultural systems and this really links to um, <laughs> to our climate agreements and the development um, of our of our nations going forward. And so agriculture is absolutely fundamental to this discussion. Um, and what we are seeing is the continued push of an industrialist, industrial agricultural system based on extractive models um, that are undermining the very basis upon which we survive and our economies um, are built. And so, so these, these, this the whole system of agriculture continues to be pushed through the, the trade laws, and particularly we're seeing now with the African Union. And so this is despite the fact that smallholders we know, um, you know, produce 90% of the seed used by um, within, within our countries. And obviously this is the fundamental basis upon which then the rest of the food system and particularly women's livelihoods um, then depend. And this shapes the entire rest of the food system. Um, and, and really, if we look at livelihoods in Southern African region, they are so dependent on food system activities. So the context of agriculture and the type of agriculture system that is, that is supported, driven by these trade deals, really then is determining the entire rest of the food system and all the livelihoods and our nutrition and our health systems that, that then go forward from this. 
So it's an absolutely critical element um, that is often not recognized for the, the, the note of control that it holds. And, and the see the, the trade laws we can we know are using these mechanisms of control to lock in um, extraction of uh, extraction of systems that are privatizing um, inputs to agriculture and um, and making it impossible for farmers to continue their traditional systems um, and the diverse the diverse kinds of agricultural systems based on appropriate systems in the local context that are fundamentally also about indigenous knowledge systems and women's livelihoods um, and farmers' rights to continue the practices um, and, and continue their mechanisms of control um, to determine their own livelihoods um, and food systems. So within Africa, we're just seeing really that, um, okay, sorry, I've spoken to that one already. So, the, the biggest issue that we wanted to raise and just using this as an example is, um, is the International Union for the Protection of New Varieties of Plants, uh, which was really a mechanism that is pushed through free trade agreements and we are seeing is pushed through the African Union and the Continental Free Trade Agreement. And it is just a very, very key example of the privatization of uh, the, the whole, fundamental structure of our agricultural system. And so what we're seeing, you know, this is a mechanism that was conceived by um, Europe, by and for European farming systems. Um, and it, it, it drives intellectual property rights um, and restrictive seed laws um, that, that then criminalize the uh, seed systems of smallholder farmers. Um, and actually narrow the diversity of agrobiodiversity array on the market and what is available to farmers. So this it, it fundamentally opposes farmers' rights, which is the basis of the, the laws and the treaties that were that were the foundation of what African governments fought for, that, that really realized that unless we protect the agrobiodiversity, um, and farmers' access to this, we will. It it really determines the rest of our of our, of our system. Um, and so then, just lastly, just particularly on the African free trade agreement. Bernd, could could you please turn off your mic? Particularly with the development of the Continental Free Trade Agreement and the various different processes that we've seen, um, is that there is a overdue influence by very powerful actors, um, and these are still funded through European countries and development cooperation agreements, particularly, for instance, like AGRA, that is shaping much of the policy development uh, within the African Union. And we saw this specifically with the development of this harmonized seed guidelines last year, as well as harmonized biotechnology guidelines for Africa. Um, and these processes fundamentally excluded um, the bottom up and inclusive processes that should have been involved in developing these kind of laws that impacted our countries and farmers so significantly. Um, and, and AGRA is a key player who's driving that. And despite considerable pushback um, from African movements, um, this still continues to be, to be pushed, um, particularly and even endorsed by some European countries. So the, as my speakers have already said before, the, the liberalization and this really that there's this missing link between our own vision for what um, our national productive policies. Um, and this includes obviously agriculture and food. Um, and really, particularly in Southern African context, smallholders and local livelihoods will be worst impacted. So there continues to be obviously this image of industrial agriculture that seems to be the broad solution proposed for our countries despite climate agreements. And that these really industrial agriculture systems are the biggest driver 
of um, climate emissions and unsustainable development in our in our regions and malnutrition and poverty and loss of livelihoods, particularly for women. Um, so, and the same process was seen with the African, the dialogues around the United Food System Summit um, and the very strong agenda that was pushed for the, for the Green Revolution of Africa based fundamentally on this privatization model. Um, so, and again, the, the major worry that we're going to see is that this common market is just really an opportunity for um, a lot of European food products to flood African markets, um, and that's both food products and then the facilitation of um, European um, inputs to agriculture um, systems and markets that might invest in our African countries, but profits is extractive and local economies and local livelihoods are, are, not, are not developed. Um, and again, our states are left um, completely under-resourced um, and complete lack of infrastructure for, for the kind of development, rural development that we need to see in our country. So, particularly in the light of the shocks that we're facing. Um, so just to finish with the, some of the recommendations that I'd like to leave is, is really the, the importance to produce the support to, to democratic processes to determine public policy. And this was particularly seen as we've seen with the, with the recent discussions in the AU and the things like the development of the seed harmonization um, policies and biotech policies that completely excluded um, farmers' voices from Africa. We need to support commitments that um, food sovereignty and the preservation and promotion of biodiversity and the inclusion of autonomy of women and youth. And these are particularly a founded and commitments that have already been made through the United Making Nations of the UN Drop and UN Drip, um, as well as those that were put forward by the Committee on World Food Security and the Civil Society Mechanism. There is a call for all EPAs to be um, frozen at this time and fairer trade agreements um, must be formed that de-link the imposition of IP regimes, particularly like UPOV, onto our countries. And IP regimes like UPOV are being pushed currently through these bilateral trade agreements, um, despite the fact that we know that they fundamentally undermine the rights of food um, and farmers' rights in Africa. EU development cooperation must instead support discrete regulatory research and political and productive um, support for farmers' rights and farmer-led seed systems, revise agriculture and trade policies to support these visions and food sovereignty um, and biodiversity protection in particular, uh, to stop the dumping of subsidized EU agricultural products on the African markets, um, and to support trade and tax investment policies that reverse the financial outflows uh, and concentrate resources in Africa to pursue its own agricultural development path. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francis. Um, we are still missing Helmut, um, uh, but I guess he will be with us in a few minutes. And now I think uh, Joachim Schuster is with us. Um, Joachim Schuster, um, I can't see you here. Are you anywhere? Yeah, I see you now. Okay. And um, you were invited to comment, to make comments on uh, the speeches of our guests today. You are a standing rapporteur for the USADC Trade Relations of the European Parliament's Committee on International Trade. Please, you have a floor for comments. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for your contributions. It's very fruitful for us uh, uh, to uh, get such an input uh, because uh, we are normally in a European bubble and uh, therefore we need a, a contact uh, with um, uh, representatives of the civil society and organizations in uh, Africa. Uh, I don't want uh, to comment all. I want to uh, um, only mention uh, uh, some aspects uh, uh, which uh, are also mentioned from you in different ways. First of all, is um, uh, I know that the uh, economic partnership agreements are political controversial. 
uh, because uh, it's a real uh, uh, it dominates an orientation on free trade. And I think that's a real problem. But on the other side, we have in mind have to have in mind uh, that if we cancel only the e pass, uh, then we uh, uh, will fall back to the WTO rules. Uh, that's no problem for less developed countries because uh, 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 there is the rule of everything but arms. So they can uh, uh, export to uh, Europe uh, what they want uh, 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 except arms. But it's a problem for uh, uh, middle income countries because uh, the WTO, WTO rules are uh, uh, much le uh, 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 less favorable than uh, the, uh, the uh, rules of the EPAS for them. And therefore, I think uh, uh, we should think about uh, how we can uh, uh, review, reform, and adapt uh, the EPAS. And I want uh, to uh, stress what I think uh, would be necessary. And we have, especially with the SATIC EPAS, the chance to do this, because at the moment we have a review process. It's the only regional uh, uh, EPA which is five years in force and ratified uh, of, uh, this, uh, uh, from both sides. And therefore, I think it's a good uh, uh, point, uh, or a, uh, point of time to uh, look what, how we can improve them. I think the EPAs are, in principle, uh, compatible with uh, uh, the continental free trade area, which is uh, planned uh, from the uh, African Union, because uh, the continent the free trade area is more an objective than a fact at the moment. And uh, it's uh, uh, the aim of uh, this free trade area is to increase inter-African inter trade and uh, deepening uh, the regional value chains in Africa. And uh, uh, this uh, similar goals, uh, uh, former goals, I must have to say, uh, of the EPAS, and therefore I think uh, we can combine them. Um, on the other side, uh, uh, this will is only as a, possible uh, uh, if uh, we really adapt and uh, with, uh, uh, the EPAS. Uh, I think the main point is uh, we have to push back the uh, priority of free trade, and we have to come uh, to uh, something like managed trade in uh, uh, different cases. And I think it is possible because. The EPAs have uh, uh, more chapters uh, than only uh, 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 free trade uh, rules, uh, uh, but only free trade rules are uh, 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 concrete, and therefore uh, the other aspects of the EPAs uh, 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 are not um, uh, implemented. And therefore, I think we have uh, some points uh, uh, which perhaps might be possible to uh, discuss uh, um, uh, in the upcoming months. And uh, perhaps it's possible to uh, find new uh, uh, agreements on this. The first is uh, we have uh, uh, that's uh, without uh, possible without an adaption of uh, the EPA, we have to fully implement the. Uh, the uh, uh, chapters on uh, uh, aid for trade uh, concerning the rules of origin, uh, customs uh, for uh, melodies, or product standards. It's very important because it's a real uh, problem for uh, uh, the trade at the moment. And therefore, I think it must, it uh, would help a lot if we improve our uh, 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 aid for trade. But on the other side, we have to uh, find new. Uh, uh, um, Points. One is uh, joint projects to improve infrastructure, joint projects uh, to combat and adapt to climate change. And a uh, second point we have uh, to look that we support uh, uh, African agriculture, uh, especially uh, smallholders, uh, uh, smallholder agriculture. And um, uh, I think there it's absolutely uh, uh, necessary that we come to manage trade. Otherwise, uh, you mentioned it before, uh, Francis, that it's uh, uh, the form of the uh, EPAS now, uh, the opposite for facilitating um, uh, smallholder, uh, smallholder farmers. In this uh, um, 
And uh, uh, we have to uh, uh, include a, a better felicitation. And uh, we have uh, all our measures, we have to include uh, more the civil societies and real African companies in all aspects. Because I think it's a very important aspect of a real partnership that we include uh, the interests of uh, uh, the African society and the people uh, on the ground there. Uh, at all, we need an investment offer, uh, 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 an, an increasing of investment uh, uh, to support these projects. The Global Gateway can contribute to this, but I think uh, uh, it's not enough because it's not enough only to stimulate private investment. We also need a huge increase of public investment uh, uh, to build up infrastructures Otherwise, uh, 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 we will not have an uh, 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 increasing uh, private investment. Uh, and uh, it was also mentioned in your contribution, I think it's uh, of utmost importance that we need a new initiative for uh, debt reduction, debt cancellation, and tackling illicit uh, financial flows, uh, because this is necessary uh, to uh, improve the financial financial conditions that African states are able uh, to contribute uh, to their or to facilitate their own development, and that's often a question of uh, um, illicit uh, uh, tackling illicit trade flows uh, and the problems with uh, uh, debt, uh, especially after um, uh, the, the Corona pandemic, because. Uh, um, there, uh, we have a worsening uh, financial situation of many states, and therefore it's of utmost important is that we work together on this issue. And I think in this way, uh, it uh, could be possible, uh, uh, but we have to discuss it, that the EPAS also, uh, uh, they are at the moment uh, 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 a very controversial uh, uh, instrument uh, could play a positive role for future partnership uh, because it's uh, absolutely necessary. But uh, I'm not sure whether the upcoming uh, summit uh, will uh, uh, give uh, the right uh, orientation there because my uh, impression in Europe is that the European side um, uh, only looks at uh, its interest and is not really on the way for a, a real partnership, uh, uh, but a real partnership would be better uh, uh, also for Europe, not only for Africa. It's not a, a, a question of paternalism uh, because uh, uh, the geo geopolitical change uh, in the world um, uh, is also in uh, there, uh, therefore it's also in the, um, uh, a direct interest of Europe to come to a better uh, uh, relationship to Africa, uh, because uh, yeah, because uh, uh, we are in a competition with China and the USA, and uh, uh, therefore uh, we have to improve our uh, relationship to Africa. But it's only possible if we uh, look also uh, at the interests of uh, the African people. Otherwise, we will lose the race against China and uh, the US. But on the, uh, the problem here is uh, that I don't, uh, that I think we have uh, in Europe a lot to do, uh, that also our uh, governments uh, realize this fact. Thank you. So I don't know exactly if Arif uh, is continuing or I shall pick up the debate and the discussion and the moderation of our very interesting um, um, webinar. But Arif, maybe you are, you are starting and then I join in. Yeah, we have, we have uh, speeches from um, all our uh, participants, speakers. And uh, we commend of Joachim Schuster. We all uh, we still missing um, Saskia. Uh, also MVP, and I would say that we can go on with, um, I'm not sure if it's a question, but it's more like a comment which was raised in the Q&A box. Um, 
Helmut, have you, uh, can you look at the Q&A box? Uh, there is a question, uh, a command from Francisco Mari from Boot für die Welt. Uh, and if you like, you can, you can go on. I would give it to you back the moderation. Okay, so I saw that there is this um, remark. Um, do you have already this remark or commentary discussed? If not, then I can read it out. Um, so there is um, Francisco Mardi, wrote for the world, has commented to the ongoing debate this evening that fortunately, for the moment, there are no bilateral trade agreements in Africa, especially not um, with the European Union through EPAS, which force any implementation of the UPAOB. African governments have refused since 2004 to negotiate services or uh, special IPR clauses in the EPA for the moment. Exception is now the EDA region, Zimbabwe, Madagascar, etc. So just um, in the region where we are this evening. And um, the, the European Union has put the UPOV clause on the table. Zambia, for its um, choice, has refused to negotiate any trade agreement with the EU, whether for goods nor services being part of the uh, ESA. So nearly all EPAs, besides uh, SADC EPA, excludes trade and agriculture from liberalization. So the free trade uh, agreement are not really behind threats to African agriculture Agri-trade is based or should be based on WTO rules on the agreement on agriculture. So that was a comment from him to the debate you had, obviously, um, uh, till now. Uh, and uh, if, if you allow, I would, not having listening to, to all the contributions through this occasional uh, coincidence with a plenary debate here in the European Parliament, um, I'm, I'm asked a lot by media, by, by, by certain journalists, uh, but also from some representatives from NGOs. Do you really think that the forthcoming EU summit starting tomorrow in Paris will ground a real equal partnership between the European Union and the African Union? And if the words of uh, French President Macron, when, when he has uh, introduced the idea of starting a new deal in Paris with this EU, with the sixth EU Africa summit, to uh, really to push forward a, a different relationship between the uh, European Union and the African Union and its member states. Um, uh, on equal footing. So, I mean, this could be um, an interesting point for me if, uh, for example, a representative, um, uh, Hamida Dedat from the COSATU in, in South Africa, with the experience we have in the, in the long time um, practical experience of economic relations between the EU, still with, a, with um, Great Britain, probably, but now even without. And, and your country, do you really think that it is possible to reshape, restructure the bilateral uh, trade and investment uh, partnership? Money is needed that we have discussed several times now in the last webinars on Western, Eastern and Northern African regions. Uh, there is a need investments. There must be a, a focus investment practice. And we have worked out in our semi uh, webinars that this must be accompanied by giving the African partner countries the ability and the power to decide by themselves in which way, in which direction these investments have to, um, to put into the, into the uh, concrete economic development of your, of your countries, of your region. So what do you expect from, from the summit, um, Hameda, um, uh, in, in this direction? 
nothing. Absolutely nothing. Um, I'm sorry if it's facetious, but I mean, you know, the thing is money, people say money is, you know, is the, is the root of all evil, but it can solve a whole lot of things. I mean, I think if, you know, if we just go back to a simple concept of humanity, and in Africa, we make reference to it as Ubuntu, um, you know, where you treat people as people, we part of a family, your, somebody else's child is your child. So, I mean, these are fundamental principles that money can't buy. And if you just go to the issue of COVID, you know, the COVID vaccine, look at the number of people in Africa, the millions that are still unvaccinated. Now, this was a pandemic that came out last year. The hype around, you know, the media, the statistics of people that were dying, the, the, you know, every single TV station you put on, whether it was international media or domestic media told you how devastating this disease was going to be. It was a pandemic and it, and it was killing people. Did you see the, the world rally around Africa? No. So, you know, fortunately for us as Africans, millions of us are still alive um, and millions are still alive despite the fact that they haven't received the vaccine. Now you go to the, to the issues of trade and you go to the patent and I think, uh, uh, was well, some student, covered this to some extent, so I would cover this to some extent. The patents are still there. Some of the leading pharmaceutical companies, um, rather than facilitating a process to build local capabilities and capacities to create jobs, to facilitate livelihoods and to ensure that people survive, began to protect and up to now protect their profits. If you look at the issue of food and food sovereignty, I mean, and, and, and for us in, in Africa, it's a serious, serious issue in terms of um, livelihoods and food security and serenity. Yeah, yeah. Amida, may, may, uh, I, may I, yeah, come on. Yeah, say. Sorry about that. I, I, I sometimes forget. So if you look at the issue of food, South Africa currently under the, the, the World Health Organization, most of our kids go to school malnourished. So children are suffering from kwashioka. And this is just South Africa that is supposed to be better developed. What about the rest of Africa? Right. So this hasn't shifted the agreement on agriculture. This hasn't changed the way in the, the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, especially if you look at the issues of rules of origin and how, uh, I'll give you an example. Um, a friend of mine worked for a, um, for, for a company, um, a European company that was based in South Africa, that was facilitating the movement of goods from South Africa to Southern Africa. Brand new vehicles, the person takes the, somebody would take the car, a couple of vehicles out that has zero mileage, they drive it around the block and it is registered as a second-hand vehicle and is then exported as a second-hand vehicle. You've got appliances like kettles, irons, toasters that are supposed to be SABS approved, right? Your, the, the voltage in South Africa and the, and the mechanisms that we use in terms of, you know, in terms of electricity versus the systems in the other parts of Sadiq or even other parts of Africa for that matter. When we're moving them, they get ticked as being fine to export via this company. But when they get there, somebody who's got no qualification, there's no certification, there's no certificate of approval or SABS approve, uh, approval to say this is safe, someone has put a, 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 a plug that is compatible with that country on that appliance. To get to get even to, to get even more personal, fish, fish with lead, was stopped at one point by somebody who worked for this company with good conscience. But it was being shipped off to Botswana, and to Lesotho and Zimbabwe from South Africa, and the and the capacity for Africans, our fellow Africans in other African countries, to control the border. And note that this lead does not reach its kids, and African kids in particular, and the consequences of that being stopped relies on good conscience. And I can give you tons and tons of examples of this. So if you look at the issues of xenophobia coming from South Africa, the issues around, I mean, we had, um, I think one of our, our um, media reporters is actually being taken to task because he was, he, he was supporting a position that there needs to be a job security um, almost like job apartheid for South Africans and that foreign, foreign, foreigners, inverted commas, from the other parts of the continent are not supposed to work 
in specific jobs. I mean, this is horrific in the context of the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. So the, the problem is huge in Africa, and it becomes worse when you look at the power relations between Africa and Europe, or even the United the ability to 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 um, decide for ourselves, or whether we decide for ourselves. I mean, it's not a it's not a neutral world. There are powers at play, and if you take South Africa for example, um, there's a push for green investment. Yet our workers in the coal sector, um, and the coal sector is not just fossil fuels in the energy space, but in terms of in the entire manufacturing value chain, in a context where we have close to fifty percent unemployment, fifty percent of our youth are unemployed. And we're talking about green investment to do away with, with fossils, right? And then the, 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 so that, if somebody asks, was the South African government making this position, has, have they given this position uh, openly? Um, have they gone through processes and engagements? Um, has anybody threatened them? No, but there's money, lots of money to be made. And people can make the individual decisions based on greed. So I think we need to think about moving away from the money and going back to humanity. I think if we can really fundamentally realize, and, if, and, and it's frightening, and, and, and I'm saying to you that I don't know whether, I'm not particularly hopeful because COVID would have shown it. The, the devastation and the, and the importance of human life, I think the COVID pandemic was the mirror, we failed. So rhetoric is rhetoric, unfortunately. I don't mean to be crude, but that's our reality. Thank you for this uh, viewpoint. Uh, there are uh, additional questions. One um, to Joachim Schuster from Boniface Mavanza, Bambu. The compatibility of the EPAS with the AFCFTA uh, you have talked about is very questionable. How do the EPAS fit the diversification and industrialization plans of the AFCFTA. And another question also to you, Joachim Schuster, freezing EPAS would not harm middle-income countries if the EU is asking in the WTO for Article 24 of the GATT waiver that middle-income countries could get full access to EU market as LDC, so the, the, the EBA preference. Um, the EU got already during the EBA negotiations from 2002 to 2008, and in practice 2014 before some signed the EPAS. So why not doing again uh, to support the start of the AFCFTA for at least 10 years in this direction. So these just two questions. And maybe the third one, I would also like to, uh, to, to invite once more Mrs. Eden Osman uh, to the question, how do you see the, the perspectives just described by Hamida to avoid money giving investments and more concentrating on human uh, aspects? Um, how the AFCFTA would be possible to be realized. Um, so is the situation from your point of view um, comparable between, for example, South Africa, the Zahel zone countries, Western African countries, etc. So, so how really to manage such a project with the existing current economic realities in the different countries and regions at the African continent. So uh, who wants to start? I leave it to you. Uh, uh, Mrs. Aden Osman, you or, or you are, please. I can come in if it's okay. Yeah. Um, I think the, the, go, the same goes for the remaining of the 13 flagship projects. Um, most of them are aspirations, I would say, at this stage. Um, free, free movement of people is far from being achieved. We're talking about African Union. The capital of the African Union is Addis Ababa. You can't go to Addis Ababa today if you're African without a visa. So there is a problem uh, saying that we will, we will open. I, we, but then again, 
the conversation, we don't know where to start. The situation is such that um, most of the time I will say, uh, this is what was supposed to happen, but then there is no political will. Where here is a situation where the political will was upfront uh, secured. In the case of AFC, FTA, they signed it off in Kigali. Upfront, 44 African countries adhere to it. Of course, we struggled a little bit with the ratifications when they came back home, but then there has been no other project under the African Union that was pushed to this extent, at least from the political perspective. Now, if the remaining of what is supposed to sustain this, as Hameda was saying, is there, no, it is not. So with it, is it going to change the lives and livelihoods of Africans immediately? Absolutely not. But is it one that needs to be sustained and pushed forward for? We, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and I think that what with, whether it is the AFCFTA or any other of those flagship projects um, Africa is trying to do is to depart from this partnership that is based on, that is really premised on the narrative according to which Africa will perpetually, will be perpetually in need. Um, that is actually no more acceptable to, to the African citizens, whether we like it or not. The expressed sentiment uh, by Africans is that Africa has potential, and that, but that this potential is undermined by foreign driven policies. So, hence the political will to push some of these agenda to correct at least the narrative and try to force a partnership that is very much not there. But while I have the floor, uh, Helmut, I wanted to, to really pick it up where uh, Mr. Schuster left it, uh, the importance of the domestic resource mobilization and the fight against uh, illicit financial flows and its, and its main enabler corruption. And to say that uh, it's a two ways conversation when if we are really talking about partnerships since we are the eve of the summit. Um, we have a two or three concrete things we are really worried about in that particular uh, field. One is, I, I was saying it uh, at, at the beginning when I spoke, is the pressure that is being put on African countries to implement the OECD tax deal. That is a very detrimental thing. It may not be today, it will be for sure in the coming less than a decade. And one of the things that somehow European Union decides to reinforce as something that is upfront not right is to also add a layer of blacklisting countries that do not accept uh, to implement standards that have been muted through processes that we all know were faulty. There is no inclusive framework that can be delivered by an OECD secretariat because there is no equal foot and equal access to even uh, these kind of processes. Now, when one or two countries uh, decide to dissociate themselves, uh, the right thing to be done by the by is to, to allow the countries that are seeing this as being a problem to carefully consider the trade offs and, and, and the best way to go about this. But even when the content is good, the pace at which it's introduced creates a level of mistrust that do not allow any constructive conversation to happen. Then it becomes an issue of Mr. Now, if the mistrust is going to happen even in plenaries, where negotiations are supposed to be structured. When, we come, when it comes down to the citizens level, it becomes a tautology that nobody wants to hear anymore because it's again, the, the rich imposing their views on the poor. And then here comes a summit where we are being told it's inclusive, we're, we're partners. You can't be partner when you can unilaterally decide a set of rules 
the so-called inclusive framework is going to change the taxing rules, international taxing rules, when we know that the behavior of the multinationals that have been really implementing what we consider still to be a fully fledged colonial days way of handling matters through which natural resources leave the shores of, the, of Africa with for very little <laughs> um, compensation and for almost no value to come up on top, on top of that and wanted to cut a deal that will prevent countries to look at what these multinationals are doing in their own jurisdiction is, is really less than, than, than fair. So the, the, the question is unilateral measures by blocks, uh, European Union being one, we keep hearing European Union, African Union, I am African. I can understand European Union, I still don't understand African Union. African Union, is it a geographic grouping only? Uh, is African Union an expression of the African will or the platform of heads of states? Is African Union, African Union Commission, one institution? Of course, the executive arm, but one institution. There are many. Your own vis-a-vis, -vis, the Pan-African Parliament is not functioning as a parliament no. on this continent. So there is a lot but who you need to discuss with. And I really appreciate uh, this effort, Helmut, of opening up the debate and accepting that it is less than inclusive, the processes through which we bring these flagship projects and the way we go about this. We have been busy, for example, to help, to try and help our, our scientists, the universities. Recently, uh, Af the, on the African side, African uh, Research University Alliance, ARWA, uh, and their vis-a-vis -vis in Europe, the Guild University of the Research Intensive Universities in Europe, have been trying to organize themselves and are looking for a ways to be heard. I mean, when you are African and you know that there is no way proper, until proper research in every field is done, you will not move an, an inch from the underdevelopment we are seeing. So the question is, if Africa continues to be seen only as a potential market and not as a continent that has people that can eventually oppose this attitude, well, we are going back to the to case zero, is to refuse to recognize that, uh, that ownership, is part of the acceptance, whether it is product, ideas, concepts. If I do not want to hear what you're going to tell uh, an African going forward, manufacturers are saying the same. Manufacturers Association of Nigeria alone, we're talking 3,500 manufacturers. You don't want to listen to that voice. I don't know who you're going to listen to. You don't want to listen to the 17 universities that are the flagship universities on the continent that have been trying to organize to co-create research outputs with their vis-a-vis -vis in Europe. And all of them are coming up, signing vice chancellors, rectors, just for them to be heard. They're not even at the table. So how is this supposed to happen when those who are supposed to be at the table, at least the voice of the European citizens, they have a parliament that in that whole architecture of the European Union uh, is there. The, the same doesn't happen on the other side. So I am, we, we are really worried about the few things. And if we were to propose few concrete things, domestic supporting domestic resource mobilization as uh, Joachim Shuster was saying is very critical. Removing pressure from governments to accept deals that cannot work uh, because we can do that in plenaries is not okay because when they come out of the plenary, nothing will work. The same goes for the fight against corruption. Fight against corruption cannot be a matter of finger pointing at a, at, a, at an African official who is embezzling. The proceeds of these of, of bribery and corruption land in, in developing countries' banks. 
but most of the time we will never name, not even media will name, they will name the person who is corrupt. They will not name the mechanism through which he evaded that much money. Money that is, that is taken never stays in the same jurisdiction. More than 80% of the cases, it goes beyond and the destinations are known. So how come the same countries that are giving themselves a moral ground to say something to others will not accept it that their banks are, are recipients of these, of these things? Banks do not exist in their own. They, they exist and function within a jurisdiction. How are these the frozen asset, the high level panel on illicit, African Union high level panel on illicit financial flows, the recent in 2020, we pushed to get what we call the CAPAR, Common African Position on Asset Recovery and Return, including, so it's not only financial the trade, trade evasion, they, they were, for example, we, we dwell for years, 10 years it took us to get everybody to accept that there is a difference between evasion and avoidance, and it is as bad. Tax avoidance is as bad as tax evasion. One is criminalized, the other one is not. That's why we talk about illegal and illicit. We need to be able to tackle both. Frozen assets of African origin in European banks today, if you dare saying we will create an exco account in African Development Bank, so while the litigation is still on, sometimes it drags more than a decade and a half, precisely because the same banks, to me, they're corporates the same way, that have been receiving these funds that know upfront that they are tainted, accepting it, will not return it. They are part of the process that will be through which we recover these funds. They determine how, what happens to them. If you tell them, deter that, take this money. It's frozen, we know if it's money that is frozen means someone has been indicted. It has been recovered from that person. The return is the process that is lingering. Now, it's frozen. Nobody is supposed to use it, that money. It should go to a development bank. We know who, why, who is linked. If it's African origin, it goes to African Development Bank in an escrow account while the litigation is on. If it is of Asian origin, it goes to Asia. That kind of language took us almost 20 years to get all the way to the UN. So the question is always the same. It is not that we can't, we can't do something. This partnership is faulty. There is a North-South conversation on almost everything. And so this dehumanized way of wanting to deal with everything cannot continue. Comes the time where they say, no, earlier I was saying, people are looking at Mali as if it was a, another, it's, it's, it's a very unique coup. It's the youth, young ones, civilian and military saying enough, no more extractism by France. So the question is the same. How, where, where do we get the right to be talking to anybody, whether you are a government, an institution, how are we going to set standards when everybody is going to be mistrusting everyone else? I wanted to, to, to I will rest my case here. Thank you very much. No, very, thank you very much for, for the, uh, yeah, for this dimension you have introduced now again into the debate and probably we all agree that uh, we can't limit the, the, the curve of debate uh, only on trade investment. It has to do with governance. It has to do with the, with the um, how to say, it, uh, constitution of the, <clears throat> of the transition uh, processes in your countries. So, but before I conclude or be before I come in, <coughs> I would give the floor to Joachim because you had got two questions. <coughs> Yes, and I want uh, shortly to respond to them. Uh, first, uh, uh, whether it's uh, we agree to this at the end or not, but we have to realize uh, the political reality of this world. And I only talk about the EPA versus the SADC states, uh, between Europe and the SADC states. Uh, both sides have decided uh, to uh, ratificate uh, this EPA. And up to now, I have not in a serious demand that uh, 
one of the uh, six uh, uh, South African governments or uh, a, a, a European government uh, wants to cancel this EPA. All say we, uh, we accept it and uh, we work with it. And therefore we have as, uh, uh, as critical uh, uh, politicians, we have uh, only two uh, uh, opportunities. We, the first opportunity is we prevent the implementation of the EPA. I think that's not a good idea because we have no alternative there. And therefore, I think the second uh, uh, alternative uh, is much better that we try to improve the EPA. And therefore, uh, I'm in favor for adapting uh, 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 new chapters uh, and new projects uh, because uh, uh, the framework of the EPA is very wide and uh, there are much opportunities uh, if you look at the text. Uh, I'm not uh, sure that we uh, 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 will be successful with it, but I think it's a better uh, alternative uh, than uh, uh, preventing uh, the implementation. And uh, also in the discussions in the public opinion, and so I see no majority on, at the uh, horizon, horizon, yes, at the horizon, uh, that there will be a majority in parliaments against uh, uh, the EPA. That's a fact, and therefore we have to act with this fact, I think. Second point is how we can, uh, uh, why can, I'm thinking that uh, in EPA can be a building block uh, also for the African uh, continental free trade area. Um, uh, the African continental free trade area is not a, a reality up to now. Uh, it's only a target and we need a, a, a long process over, I think, 20 years or so at the end uh, with many work to do that uh, this, uh, that the African states uh, will uh, achieve this uh, target. And therefore they have uh, to uh, 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 in the measures which are necessary to achieve the targets are nearly the same what the, uh, the EPA uh, wants to do. We want to promote regional trade, regional value change. Regional means between more than one state in uh, Africa. Uh, we need to. Uh, we want to support the trade. That means uh, we have uh, to look what are uh, the barriers uh, against. It. For example, infrastructure. Uh, 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 and so on. And therefore, uh, if we uh, 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 are successful uh, to uh, uh, realize uh, this in a, region, in a regional context, then it uh, uh, increases the chance that's all so uh, possible for uh, whole Africa. And therefore, I think uh, it's uh, possible. And, uh, uh, it can be a building block uh, for uh, the uh, African continental free trade area. Uh, but uh, uh, last remark, uh, I'm not sure whether it's really a good target, uh, such a free trade area for the whole continent, uh, because then you have a special division of labor and, uh, 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 in, uh, within Africa, and there uh, will also uh, um, be winners and losers of this process. But this decided the African states, and if, uh, the African Union said, we want, uh, uh, the majority of African states want to build it, it's okay. Uh, but I think uh, 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 there are the, main, uh, the same issues on both, uh, in both uh, aspects uh, concerning the free trade area as well as the EPAS. And therefore I think uh, we can combine it. Uh, we will see whether we are successful. That's my, uh, often our problem that we have not uh, the majority for uh, such a policy. And uh, uh, I think uh, we will see it in the, at the next time on the African uh, EU summit, uh, because I'm not uh, uh, very optimistic uh, that they will, uh, we will re uh, have really uh, uh, real progress uh, uh, concerning and building up an uh, equal uh, partnership of equals. Uh, that's not uh, my, uh, I have not the impression that uh, Europe is at the, uh, uh, knows what, uh, or uh, is that uh, Europe is on the way to this. Nico anmachen. We are unfortunately we are nearing already to the end of our today's webinar because time is running, as I understand. 
there would be a lot of other aspects to be discussed, I think, um, very, very, very necessary and very, very uh, interesting and challenging to all of us. I only wanted to say, just coming back to, to the last issue on the EPA, that uh, Jane Nalonga from Santini is with us from Uganda, and she informed, because we have discussed it shortly last time, uh, that uh, there is a demand by the government of Tanzania that they not have agreed to the EPA with the EU and the East African community. So the, 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 the different what is it, positions of, re of, of countries in these regional networks are continuing. And of course, that is a question, how to build up then a, a, a circular economy, at least in a region, which is establishing better conditions for, 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 for constructing a self-reliant economic development in the interest of the citizens and in defending the environment. So that I think is, is very um, important here. And uh, um, I would just uh, give all the three panelists two minutes more to make a summer uh, summarizing if you want, if you wish. Um, uh, you know all that we have recorded this webinar. You can also have access to the recordings of the uh, three other webinars uh, we provided already. Uh, and uh, so that we have maybe an equal access to try to understand what has been remarks, what has been ideas, what has been initiatives put for the Europeans being in a listening mood, a lot of, I would say, headaches for rethinking how we can shape also the parliamentarian debates to press on the commission, to press on the council, to press on the governments of the EU member states to change its attitude. And so this is our task. And therefore, I would say it is also the task of all of us to press the political deciding uh, structures, the parliaments and uh, the governments to change the attitude in organizing a, a constructive relationship between member states of the European Union, the European Union and uh, African and all 54 uh, African countries uh, in, inside the African Union. So uh, I just go around. Um, um, Francis, you want to come back into this final round? Thank you. I just wanted to just say, particularly on the last comment um, on the SADC trade relations, is, um, you know, thank you, the point really investment in, in infrastructure development. And, and the thing is, though, is really is that public infrastructure that is benefiting people's spaces, um, public infrastructure for the local economy, for public housing, access to better health care. And the thing is, though, is, is a lot of these decisions are being made by international cooperating partners in our countries, and they exclude local grassroots movements in the conversations around who determines what kind of infrastructure, where money is flowing, from cooperating agreements, particularly from coming from Europe. And then seeing these coming from the SEDAC uh, trade discussions as well. Um, and these decisions are made without then the consultation of grassroots organizations and people. So they're, they're really important, but it's just again in speaking to the to the power dynamics there. And so so thank you. These points have all been you know, very, very uh, useful, but but it's just then the mechanisms of how these uh, these these trade negotiations happen. And so I would just really, even within our countries, is is the discussions around, but particularly like with the SADAC trade relations, is that better efforts to make um, inclusion of of people's movements and grassroots um, organisations in country to bring them into these kind of discussions. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Uh, who is there then, the next one? So, uh, you want to come in once more shortly? <clears throat> well, mine is to really thank you uh, yourself. Uh, the, I think this has been, uh, I've followed only another one among this in the series. So really thank you for what I consider to be a very important convening. 
And uh, we do hope that we will see uh, something changing. I, I think it's always a start with, with, with dialogues at the level we can, we can properly and honestly converse. And this has been open, frank, and, and quite inclusive. So really, really thank you. We do hope that the two things that we are we, we wanted to not to see happening uh, so that the future trade relationships are not hampered. The OECD tax deal and the current resistance to, to the sharing of IP rights for the COVID-19 vaccine uh, with Africa will be, will be really dealt with quickly so that uh, we're not left, uh, the people are not left with a bitter, bitter things, um, bitter, um, I would say uh, sentiments uh, that will, because the, the, whoever we are, wherever we come from, when these things happen, they stick. So we do hope that we will, we will see better days um, going forward. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. And uh, finally, I give the floor to uh, Hamida Didat. Thanks very much. So, you know, Hilmut, um, I must say, when I started doing work on trade, one of the most devastating um, realizations is when people used to say that a European car um, in terms of subsidies is way more than what uh, most African households survive on, um, with many of us or many African people surviving on less than a dollar a day. I think if the EU, and, and this is, I mean, I did put a challenge to you earlier saying that if you really wanted to talk about uh, leveling the, the playing field and um, ensuring that the mechanisms for the AU in, 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 the, in the sense of the EU are becoming a reality and that the ACFTA can be, can, can be an all-encompassing agreement. Um, that was the one challenge. The second one was the issue of actually doing a, a, a monitoring and evaluation, you know, a, a matrix to look at what the impacts and consequences have been. But I put a third one. When, when, when an African family can actually own the cow of Europe, um, and when, when the agreements on agriculture, the subsidies um, can, be, can be something of the past, then I think we're really being serious. Um, thanks very much. Thank you very much. And Joachim, you want to come in once more or? No, I have not. No. <laughs> okay, you, you, you have already uh, spoken, yes. And uh, so then I want to thank all of you for, for really participating in this as I guess, very lovely and, 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 and enriching uh, webinar. Uh, I want to thank all the visitors and participants in, in the webinar. Um, as usually, I have to say, we have a very uh, experienced um, uh, colleague, former colleague with us, a former uh, head of the International Trade Committee of the European Parliament, Helmut Markov, who is following this webinar series. And I, I hope, uh, that we get some input from him about the impressions and the proposals, what to do with that. And um, I want to thank very much the interpreters, making it possible always to, uh, to understand each other, to, to communicate into the, into the public life. And uh, I would say, maybe commenting the last comment from uh, Hamida, that maybe the third point would not be that then the African are sitting in European cars would be the, 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 the to be achieved aim, but that we are together are organizing a public transport system, which is get, giving everybody um, the full availabilities and opportunities to move wherever she, he um, wants to go. And by that also to avoid to repeat certain mistakes in the individualization of of this um, infrastructure um, momentum, but that is maybe already the next debate. Uh, so I have learned through all the four webinars a lot. Um, uh, and I hope that we are staying in contact. Uh, probably I come back to all of you with, uh, with certain questions, etc. when we are finalizing our report. And of course, uh, the report is one thing, but to shape the reality is even much more uh, necessary and important. Thank you very much. All the best. Stay safe.